Welcome to Become Famous Podcast, the ultimate destination for achieving fame in your industry. Join us for discussions as we uncover the strategies and secrets to becoming known, navigating cancel culture, and staying authentic. Stay tuned because here at Become Famous, the journey to fame begins now. Welcome to Become Famous. I'm really excited to have Ian Peterman, who is the founder of the Conscious Design House and the Conscious Design Method. And I met him about a year ago. And amazing how time flies. Yes, yes it is. <laughs> but what was really fascinating about him is he challenged me with a quote that actually changed the direction of the remainder of my year. And what was that quote? He talked, we met at a luncheon and it was about Einstein. And what Einstein says is if I have an hour, I'm paraphrasing right now, but what Einstein said is if I have an hour, I will spend 55 minutes planning and five minutes executing. And that grabbed my attention. So welcome, Ian. Thanks. Yeah, it's a good quote for everyone, every time. <laughs> it is, but um, tell me about that. How did you come to that quote? Because I think that really is a baseline for, for your whole vision and idea is the we don't put enough of an emphasis on the planning. And for me, I've always been someone so focused on getting ready for the execution, but really what's going to make the execution very successful is the planning. Yeah, it, it's um, it really plays into the whole oh, five-year overnight success or the 10-year overnight success. We're, we're really focused on that. Oh, we did it and we, we accomplished something part. And we like to forget or ignore the fact that there's a large run-up. There's a lot of work and planning to get there. Um, and so that that quote just kind of fit perfectly with with that idea of like really acknowledging all the upfront stuff you have to do the, the planning the observation your favorite pillar for conscious design yes. um it really just is like the best short version of the why it's so important well, it did. It changed because I was fast forwarding, really going crazy about getting my book ready, which is actually ready right now. I got to show it on my screen here. I'm really excited. Finally, the book came out. But yes. when I met you, and it, I'm so appreciative of that quote and meeting you and tapping into, in a small framework, the conscious design, the sense of observation, the sense of really sitting down and planning and I was really wanting to publish the book last year the time I met you and what I did was we took almost eight months extra round and I believe that's really going to attribute to the foundation of the success of the book that's coming out in May but it was just so fascinating people we don't we don't want to plan no we hate <laughs> we hate planning and, and we just uh, we kind of collectively ignore it right even let's let's use musk as an example right people look to him or steve jobs right oh look they created this great thing um you know or even spacex right they're like oh it's just go do a prototype what people f very quickly forget is that Musk spent years talking to engineers researching working this isn't like this is an idea spacex was an idea of his for a long time before he started burning through prototype rockets. Like that's just, now he's in execution phase, but it's not, he didn't skip planning. <laughs> no, but right. I think it's so hard. Like, so you get this pressure on you because when you're in the planning phase, you don't get credit for planning. Oh yeah, nobody, almost nobody knows about it either. Nobody knows There's about it. There's no you're publicity. on planning, right? <laughs> so when you keep saying, I'm writing this book and people are just rolling their eyes, like how long are you gonna be writing this book? How long are you gonna be doing it? And then, and then when something comes out there, then you get all the credit, but you almost get bitter over the credit because you really wanted the credit while you were planning. <laughs> yeah, now I'm done working. Now I get credit for all the work that is done. Like, okay. It's, yeah. It would have been motivational to get the credit. Right, but no one sees it. And I think that's the hardest yeah. part about planning is no one sees what's growing. It's kind of like a plant. You're growing and growing and growing and no one sees it until you finally, finally spread out a little bit. But it that phase of being underneath the earth and no one seeing you and yet what you're ta what you and Einstein are telling us is 90% of your time is getting ready for the spurt. 
Yeah, and I mean, to use the nature analogy, right, you think about, oh, an acorn, acorn turns into a great big oak, right? Well, it's it spends, it grows on the tree first, then it falls, then it eventually gets underground, and then it starts to grow. And then eventually it pops up, but it's just like this little baby. You're like, oh, you finally see something, but it's not a big tree. It takes it takes time, and we we really hate that <laughs> as as a species, as culture right now. We really don't value that time and effort because we don't. I like guess maybe it's because we don't see it. Also, we have like three second attention spans, so that's probably not <laughs> not helping with it. Yeah, but um, uh, it gave me. And I think this is why I'm so excited that we're we're talking about it. It gave me really, I think the quote really it changed my direction, it, because it gave me the permission to have planning, permission to have the time to plan, and a permission and an understanding that you're not going to get credit. But having someone like Einstein say 90% of your time should really be focusing on planning and getting it right before it's even out there. It would just, it really, even like with Facebook, they're always doing this beta, they're testing out there. And and so you're feeling this pressure of execution. But I think going back to the sense of honoring the observation time, that's why I love your observation. And so I'd love for you to tell the listeners right now about conscious design, because that's really the basis of conscious design as I see it, as I understand it, and having read your book, uh, and you're going to have the second edition coming out soon, which we're really excited about because we are publishing at St. John's Press. And I'm just really excited uh, because I just feel it's such an important message um, to tell us about the conscious design method, which has really got sense, I would say, a baseline from Einstein's quote. It, I actually found that quote... I probably heard it at some point before, but I really have found a quote and started using it after I wrote the book. After you wrote the book, so okay. it was. It was. So you were thinking this before you met Einstein. I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking it. I mean, I I definitely have spent quite a bit of time studying Einstein and other people like like that. Poly, right. The polymath, right? Um, and so I'm. I may have heard it subconsciously somewhere. Right. It's in there, but you know, after you spend a year writing a book and really diving into it then when you hear a quote like that then you're like oh i get it it's it relates to what i'm doing right now that's um, so fascinating so it's it is it's it's funny how those things <laughs> how those things happen but it matches your message it does it's, it's totally great matching. which is why i love it oh, yeah. it's it's a perfect quote that i now <laughs> yeah. use a lot more so tell us about the conscious design. So conscious design is built on four pillars. It's observation, connection, and impact, and inclusion. And it's a design thinking method meant to lay on top of whatever else a company is using or a designer is using to help with your the lens that you use those tools with in, in order to create more circular and more impactful products long term profitably and it's interesting so some of your listeners might not know but ian and i are very much passionate about the circular economy which is really about utilizing a product over and over again making sure you're not using virgin products when you don't have to and changing ourselves from leaving the linear economy where we use and throw use and throw but finding a way to be better stewards of our products and so what conscious design does it is a way of thinking so that we live in a circular life where we are going back to nature and nature doesn't waste and we want to learn how we use everything in a way that we minimize the waste in our lives. Yeah, and the, the idea is that if you have the correct lens, exactly, then when you go to solve things, what is, whatever tools you already have, right? There's nothing, or I'm not trying to get rid of ergonomics or say this is the replacement of ergonomics, right? Um, you know, those things are all there. There's design method thinking, there's project management tools, yeah, yeah, all, all that stuff. But if you look through it through the right lens and you apply those tools, then you'll always get a product that is circular. You'll always be thinking with that that in mind and so that's what this is this is how how you can be asking the right questions you know you do all the observation that's great but 
now how do you write the uh, you know answer the right questions how do you go through that how do you include the right people how do you connect with your customers your clients and make really you know it's like the the holistic approach to product development yeah and and i think we intuitively did the conscious design method when we were creating a stand for the ONS, which is the oil and, it's an oil and gas conference, and we wanted to make the statement that it was 100% circular. So we created and assigned before in our planning phase, everything we do is gonna be circular. What does it mean? That we're gonna be using everything 100%. How can we bring everything 100% back to nature, 100% in a way that we're utilizing the resources in the best honorable way. And I remember the designer was like, what? But we created the <laughs> framework, right? And then did the observation, which is the first phase where you're observing and figuring out how do we actually execute this? How do we plan it? And so like, for instance, what I thought was fascinating when we made this assessment, we're gonna be circular in the best way, the best stewardship of it, we actually decided to use plastic plants, right? Because the goal was this stand was gonna last for 10 years. So if it's gonna last for 10 years and we were looking at the math and being being carbon neutral or being as minimizing our, our usage of, of the footprint, we then saw plastic plants from Ikea was better than buying new plants every single time we have the conference. So it's just interesting if, in that observation phase, could you tell us a little bit more? Because I just think that's such a fascinating, and I think for our listeners, when you're doing something, doing a contrary action of just thinking, I gotta execute, taking those extra rounds of observation can save time and money. Yeah, well, I, th I think the the analogy that I, I shared with you and I love is you know the difference between giving yourself some planning time and just going for it without any planning is the difference between you being blindfolded, put on the middle of a, a race track, and spun around a few times. If you just start running, you have no idea what direction you're going to go in. <laughs> you could be, you could be going forward. You might be able to keep up with everyone else. Right. You also might be sprinting in the exact opposite, which is terrible, right? If you take half a second even, right, to pull off the blindfold, look around and go, oh, this is the direction I need to go, right? Now you know that you're going in the right direction. You have that information. And so that's and that's that's the reason why observation is so important. And it's why I think you and, and other people really click with it is it's kind of a, a oh, duh moment, but we don't value it. We don't, like we were talking about earlier, right? We don't value the, right, if you're in a race, you're like, I need to be running it. I need to be running in the right. race. And instead realizing, oh, if you take the half second to pull the blindfolds off, you can run in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll be then you're in the race. So right. you could be you could be running, but you may not even been, be in the race because you're running in the wrong direction. Right. You could be off the track and <laughs> fully somewhere else. So it's to to really make sure that you, you know, when you set the goal, right? You guys set the goal of we want our our booth to be circular. You have to set that goal and then you have to look at what's there and then always come back to it, right? And if you hadn't, how circular do you think your booth would have been? It would have been. <laughs> but what I also like is your other point of being inclusion, right? Are you including everyone? And I think this fits in with, with the theories that I have in, in my book is that we're not enough being 360 in assessing who are all the people that should be a part of it. It's not just about the direct lineage towards your client of making money, just thinking about that one channel, but it's thinking about all these other people. And what I like about the conscious design is number one, you're observing, but how do you put more people in that planning phase to help you have the best execution? Yeah, it's, you know, being, being inclusive, right? That pillar for us is really, who is who is this involved, right? Is let's take your booth for example. Like who's who's building it, who's designing it, who's going to use it, who's going to see it. Right? There's as soon as you start to actually sit down and take some planning time to realize everyone that's actually 
going to interact with even just a booth at a conference, there's quite a few different people involved, right? And so including them as but you, you know, we probably can't talk to the visitors of the event beforehand. Right. But but you can you could maybe talk to people that have been there or people that go to other conferences and get their input and get their thoughts. Talk to who's gonna build it. They're gonna there's a lot more when you start to do that, you start to blend ideas and this, it really is I would say the way we work with inclusion, it is the opposite of silos. It is one hundred percent tearing those walls down and going, Yeah, we all are gonna be we're all going to touch and be part of this. Let's talk before <laughs> at the right. beginning instead of it going through you know, I've I've talked about this. I've I've worked at big companies, I worked at HP, I've worked at Nike and you know when you get halfway through the process and then you're finally being told about it. It's it can be late. The directive yeah. might come down, and they go, "Hey, we want this to be more sustainable." And you're like, "Well, we're three months from production. It's a it's a little late to do anything about that now." And so, really making sure that you have all the right people in the room at the beginning to get their feedback and their input. Yeah, and it's interesting you say that because I think sometimes we forget who should be in the room. Oh, yeah. uh, and we think about like we at least for a lot of times for me the temptation is the titles, uh, the power of the person that can the power of the purse, yeah. and sometimes the best people. And I've been humbled several times by the my assistant or the assistants or the interns have the best ideas. Like for instance, my trainee Sage totally decimated this book like in the fall, and I was absolutely devastated. But uh, it was the best thing that ever happened, right? Because then you finally got someone that's a, uh, that was a Gen Zer saying this doesn't work, and <laughs> I was like, "Great, you're telling me this now." But well, it was great, and and if I had had her in the room earlier, I would have not wasted as much time. Yeah, it's it's really th- those things, right? Yeah, you're totally right. We focus on title like oh you're the vp of this or you're a c-suite and you know in my experience it's always you know if you're talking about producing products the welder on the floor knows more about that product than you right do why because they've built half a million of them in the last 20 years right? right they've been doing this a long time so it's it's understanding where there there's there's power and then there's also knowledge, right? And it don't they don't they, they don't mix all the time. They don't mix all the time. That's a rare. That's a rare combo it when you. Combo. So really knowing where the information is and and you know that's part of part of the observation, right? Is who actually knows about it the most, and and who is the most uh, most impacted by it, right? So you have observation, and we're including people. What's the next step? Um, after after observation, you really can. They're all together, right? Right. They're more, and this is this is something that I. It's a process because this is more circular thinking. Right. They are pillars to the same building. There's no exact order go through that oh i love that i (laughs) love that it's that's that is and that's one of the things that right and just everybody goes okay well step one what's step two what's step three what's step four (laughs) and and the answer is they are step one okay so (laughs) step step one but we've done we've mixed up observer observation and inclusion what are the other two points we should include in step one so (laughs) (laughs) so inclusion is one of the or uh connection is one of the other other pillars and so what that is about is making sure that you have good connection right so that's yeah the the welder might know what's happening the assistant might know what's happening but do you if you're the decision maker do you have a clear clean path of information that isn't a power struggle dynamic that allows them to be able to communicate to you and you communicate to them how are you connecting with those people right you get them all in a room oh, yeah. but now what do you do because you, if i'm this is kind of like a i'm ceo right or i'm i'm the chair the chairman of the board right 
you're the assistant of the assistant right. of the manager of a floor. Like yeah. that, that is a, that is another silo. Oh, that's interesting. So we might all be in the same room and we might luck out. Maybe, maybe the assistant says something and we all hear it. But maybe she but doesn't. Maybe they say nothing. Right. And they may not have the answer, but they don't feel heard. They don't feel that connection. So how, Focusing oh, on wow. building yeah. these connections so that you can do it. And companies companies have, have tried. Their companies have put into place some things. Um, Amazon is actually one. So their right. entire AWS that they have, where they host everything from government to people, right? that was a, an engineer's idea. Oh, really? There's, I don't know if he got paid for it. I hope he gets a commission on every single one of their sales. <laughs> but it but it was an, an engineer just working off going, hey, I need this. Can we can we build this for uh, for me, basically, for right. my team? And then they grew it and grew it, and now it's, it's one of Amazon's biggest revenue streams. That's so interesting, because you're right. Sometimes um, I will bring, I will observe, and I will include, but have I really created the connection for everyone to feel seen and heard and having their ideas shared? And I like what Simon Sinek always says for leaders is to go last, letting everyone else say things. Uh, and that's a method of connection, I believe, uh, is to make sure that then everyone can say something. But even then, do you have the culture of connection? Do you have that culture of the assistant, the person that feels like they're the lowest on the totem pole or the welder that's been there for 20 years not feeling heard, how do you actually create the culture of them expressing themselves? And not only that, but the CEO or the people of power, having been so used to being in power and having so used to having the privilege of their voice being heard, creating so that they will actually listen. That's a really powerful point. That's, and it is hard. I mean, yeah, <laughs> there's no. it, it's there's not an easy button for for that. No, it's not. It takes and it and it's very much to what you say, it's a culture. Yeah. It is it is something that you have to very intentionally, very consciously create and maintain. And and that's one of the you know if you if you look at companies that start up, become big, right? Turn they oftentimes lose that because it takes a lot of effort and it's it's again one of those things that we don't we don't value and appreciate very much so there's not a line item when you're going through your financials that says <laughs> this is this How is the monetary <laughs> this is the monetary benefit of our connection this is your budget for being connected to your team this is your but like there's no that's not a line item your board reviews right but it cover it's a blanket on everything if it is bad it's it's a wet blanket <laughs> you're right <laughs> it's you're bad. absolutely right no you're absolutely right and uh so after observation uh we've done the diversifying we've made sure they're connected what's the last point impact impact so this is it's twofold one is what is your impact right now mm -hmm. right so Going back to observation, you should observe what is your impact, what is the impact of other people in your space. Right. Because that's important. You need to know where you're making impact. Yeah. But then also to plan what do you want it to be. Hmm. And this is where a lot of um, brands get this right. The newer brands that are mission driven, they understand this, this little piece they're really good at because they build their mission around, we want to impact this. We want to help this group right. of people. We want to make this change in the world. Right. Right. That's that's kind of your core mission-driven piece. Mm -hmm. you, you need the rest of it. But but right. if you're mission-driven, you probably have this down at least somewhat. Mm -hmm. um, but it also ties into observation and, and all of this because you need to look, when you look at impact, right, let's take... Let's take our smartphones, right? Right. The number of people impacted by just this particular phone alone is in the thousands. Right. Because, you know, there's multiple, this takes multiple continents, mm -hmm. hundreds of companies. Right. Thousands of employees. Right. 
those are they're all impacted right this this phone has positively or negatively impacted every single person that's been involved yeah so. well 86 percent of the world has a smartphone so that's a lot of people <laughs> it is it's like uh, the majority of the world has a media company in their in their pocket right so it's it's understanding and it's being a opening up the doors too because right now like we can have a i could probably have a conversation with most companies and they'll be able to list some people they're like oh we have our customers our employees but expand it to well if you have a vendor they have employees they're in a city what is their impact to their community right right so when you start to do that not that you can necessarily directly control it right but you can start to realize what are the impacts mm -hmm. and then filter through where can I control? Right. What can I change? What can I decide? Right. And if you really do that, then when you go to I have a mission statement, you'll know what impacts you can control. And that's where you can start setting your goals. So you can go, OK, well, we're going to make these positive impacts in these areas because we took the time, figured out where we're impacting, and these are the ones that we actually have control over. Right. It's fascinating. And uh, and you, you've you got an amazing vision for this. So I got really, really excited about it because uh, I've worked in climate for 20 years now, or not 20, 15 years with uh, climate issues from circular economy, before that uh, carbon capture and storage, really finding how do you create, be better stewards, working on language. And what I like so much is, I think you've come up with the best solution. Well, thank you. <laughs> no, I really do. And I, and, and I think that's the reason why our author, Bjorn Alathon, came out with a book uh, called Let's Get Practical. And uh, you are a contributor writing a, a chapter and, and and more so than that, helping kind of set the framework for the book. And really the reason why is that to really solve the climate issue and the environment, it is in the design phase and that 80% of, of the solution is really there. And I like when you were saying about it when you worked at HP is that you're thinking about a solution too late down the line when you're just about to hit the go button, that's not the time to think about it. This is why that observation is so important. And so you are, and I love this, I love people with great visions, but you have this amazing vision for Conscious Design House to create it to be the Bauhaus 2.0. And I'd love for you to tell the listeners about the Conscious Design House and tell us about Bauhaus 2.0 and give that color that inspired me and a lot of people right now getting behind your your vision. Yeah, there's it's, it's amazing the uh, response that we <laughs> that we've I know, had it's to incredible. this. incredible. I mean, it's it's really um, exciting. Yeah, the the idea behind it, right? Wrote the book. That was great. That's just a placeholder, really. I right. know, books books are good, but I really wanted to turn into something with more more action, actually right. actually accomplishing something, and so the the idea came about um, really from I studied design history in college, and one of the main things that we really studied was Bauhaus and how much impact the Bauhaus movement had as we transitioned from mass production or into mass production from just craft. Crafting. So tell about the Bauhaus movement. What did the Bauhaus movement do? So they basically, early 1900s, right, we start transitioning from, I'm just, I'm a craftsman, I'm a potter, I'm, I, you know, I build things one at a time, great objects, but Henry Ford has created the production line, we've now started to mass produce, speed up production, and they were at the time all pretty ugly. And all designers at that point, all, all the craftspeople were, were crying about how ugly and uh, and ugly undesigned it was, was. Yeah. because they they were doing it just for mass production and so Bauhaus came about as a way to address that and go okay well this is this wave is coming there's nothing we're not going to be able to really stop it people want product right how do we go about infusing good ideas and design and not completely losing the craftsmanship that we had before and bringing it to mass production. And so there's a, they had a school in Germany that moved around a couple of times, um, but they, they 
were so influential. Every every well known designer that was alive at that time basically ended up either going directly to school or learning under one of the people who went to that school. And so all of all of American design, European design is all based on Bauhaus. They created minimalism as one of their things. That's that's where we actually remember them most is we really focus on that. But they were also very much for having the designer stay with the entire process from idea through mass production. And they were very much about bringing in new technology and how do we embrace the new technology without it destroying everything? How do we use it to the best advantage? Um, and they, World War II happened, that kind of ended design in Germany for a while, that the, the house went down. Um, and so it really killed the movement. So they had a good run from the early 30s till 40s when Nazi Germany. Yeah, so Nazi Germany ended it, but it didn't really end. I mean, a lot of the seeds, you got to be studying this, you know that? Uh, it's, it's, so, fa it's fascinating. I, and it was it? so fascinating to me. So it's like the seeds of, of the Bauhaus movement ended up in Harvard, Chicago, University, University of Chicago, and, yep. and Harvard. So, But what I thought was fascinating when you're telling me about this is that when the houses went down, the movement went down. But right. now we're so lucky we've got internet. Yeah, now you don't need a house. No, but, but you do. You kind of need <laughs> you a house. Do, you but, do, but, it's but it doesn't. And, and that's why we the conscious design goal is conscious design house will have multiple locations, multiple countries. That's why we're looking at you know Norway, U.S., Dubai, Germany. Right. And we introduce online, which is you know I, I feel like if Bauhaus had had online, it would have stayed. They would have been able to stay alive and rebuild a house in a different location after right. after the war. But here we are. We're having, a, a, I would say, a similar revolution in that we're going from the linear economy to the circular economy. And it's a big way of thinking change. Yeah, and I think I should tell the... So what we are seeing, and that's what the book that we have called Let's Get Practical with Bjorn Alethon, and then uh, Ian, and I was a contributor, and so was J.J. Brown, is that what we're seeing in the tea leaves, and that's what we loved so much when we met with you, and Bjorn was interviewing you and, and having you in the book, writing a chapter and so forth, is that we're seeing the movement towards a circular economy intuitively. People are just trying to find ways to be more sustainable, utilizing products more, trying to create a value chain that is bringing the product back into production, if not into production, finding a way to utilize it as energy, or we something called upcycle, where the product is cycled up to a different product. And all of this we're seeing is we're moving towards a circular economy. And what I love so much about what Ian is doing is he wants then to have Bauhaus 2.0. How do designers now meet this new future? And I just think that's so exciting. Yeah, it's it's customer demand is there. Yeah. But we, you know, as designers, we haven't trained for that. <laughs> it's no, not, we're not. This is a You're new race. Trained. We're right. getting we're getting dropped on the track right now and we have to figure out how to do that. So that's the goal of Conscious Design House is to be that be that direction and to right. really bring together, you know, cuz one of the benefits of of Bauhaus original one was that it brought together artisans and craftspeople and designers, everyone. It wasn't right. it wasn't just, all right, the engineer mechanical engineers are gonna sit in a room now and and ignore everyone else. And so the, that same concept with conscious design house is how do we bring together people that are working on AI? How do we bring in programmers, designers, architects, buildings, products, cars, bring them all together because circular economy can't be achieved in one vertical it's impossible the world is too connected there's you know we talked about this the circles within circles within right. circles right we are we're literally on a round planet so there's like one big circle <laughs> and then it just goes down smaller and smaller from there and so the the piece of realizing that there is no way to extricate yourself from it you are not 
uh, it's one of the things with linear thinking is right is you can be in a box right the reality is you you might be in the box but that box is still in a circle exactly like, <laughs> you didn't actually escape it you might be ignoring it right but you didn't actually escape it and so how how can we bring everyone together and be able to look at the whole set of circles and not just one piece and that, that in my mind if we design that correctly then we'll have we'll be able to have a truly circular economy and and uh society and we're not really there yet but that's what the whole point of the conscious design is is to come together like the Bauhaus and together find those solutions and that's what I like about your whole conscious design thinking is it is uh, bringing all this inclusion of all these people together making sure you're connecting all of them to create the impact you want and then all yes. of it is in observing first which I, I I really I can't stress enough how important that is and I did not because you feel so much pressure in society today to perform to execute just get it out there and and there is some truth to that and how do you balance the truth of doing and sometimes doing it imperfectly is better than not doing it and then yet at the same time having that understanding of observation yeah i i think it's um it is a balancing act, right? But really, it comes down to what is the actual need at that time, and what's what makes sense, right? Is there is there some extra urgency required to it? Like, right? If if you're hungry, I'm not suggesting that you sit there and debate about it right. whether you should eat for. Right three days and then, and then right. eat, right? So there's, you know, there's a time and a place for both. Right. And there's not really, there's not really a magical catch-all answer of here's, here's the question to ask and it's a yes, no, fork in the road. Right. It really, it really is, you know, I think that you always have to do some thinking. Right. The amount that you take will vary. Right. There's no, there's no perfect, perfect set amount. Right. Um, you know, if it's but when it comes when it comes to let's say we're talking about somebody's wanting to launch a product, wanting to launch a brand, right. right? These are these are things that yeah, you should you should start working on it. But I but I think this is where that whole we don't really value this phase. You are working, you are doing something on it. So when people say, hey, you should be doing something, you're writing your book for eight months, no one knows what you're doing. It, it doesn't matter because you are doing something. You are working on it. And we yeah. need to count that. And I know, but it's so it, hard. I don't know I know. It it, is. No one's shining a flashlight going, you know, you're doing so good. Here's the cheer team. Here's no the, here's no the, one even cares what you're doing. They just think, oh, that's another person saying you're writing a book. And they're right. You know, how do you actually show the performance of and and how do you give credit to it i don't know if there is a way and maybe I'm this sure, is where you just have a stamina of understanding i don't know i'm sure there's somebody that has an idea of how to change that part of our culture i don't no 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 <laughs> I don't and know that's how. why i but I, but it is i th i think that is an important piece though so maybe somebody listening to this yes, has an idea can help, uh, let us know what your solution is <laughs> right um because it it does hamper a lot because it's and like i'm not perfect i i do this too if i'm sitting i do not always feel accomplished when i at the end of the day all i've done is had some meetings and doodled and something like i'll go ah, i i wasted the day not really though i those are all things like giving value to all the stuff like the reason we're sitting here today is because of all the stuff for our entire lives happened right so it, it's not if anything in our lives had changed been different this may never happen there's no. no and there's no way for us to know right no there's no no way somebody could walk in and prove <laughs> that it would be the same with with a change right so it's really valuing all of that and then also you want to have some intentionality you gotta you gotta decide what you want to do right it's setting it down with the company you gotta you want to launch a new brand you have to actually plan because if you don't right. you'll be one of those companies that maybe you'll make it maybe you won't 
But even if you make it, you probably end up failing or you'll hate like it's not going to be what you want it to be. It'll just happen. And that's where like one of the things that we we talk about from conscious design that there's this we've pulled out this idea of legacy branding. And the whole idea with that is you actually have to think about it if you want your brand to last 100 years you want to be the next macy's or next jp morgan right you gotta actually think about these things you can't yeah. just you don't just happen to end up with a long-lasting valuable no. brand it takes work <laughs> it takes planning it takes time and you just that's the way it is and I, would, I don't know how to make everybody value yeah. that, but that, but it is valuable. You know, it's, oh, what is it, Coca-Cola's logo is worth a billion dollars just by itself Yeah, as no. an asset. It didn't just happen overnight. Didn't happen <laughs> overnight. But I think what's great is you do these workshops on conscious design. So if yes. people would like to connect with you and do that kind of, a, you can do it online or in person, but I've really appreciated all steps into one, but at the same time doing those steps, I think yes. is a very, very powerful move. And then if people want to connect with you, they can connect with the Conscious Design House. You've got yep. a website, ConsciousDesignHouse.com. We'll put it all in the show notes. Uh, you can connect there, looking for founders, looking for people that really want to help shape it. And what I like so much about it is you're gathering designers, but what you're, you're very particular about who you're gathering right now in the beginning of this dialogue yeah so we're we're we haven't opened up general just membership yet right no. now we're just focused on bringing in what you said founders that are really really believe in this they want to grow this maybe they've tried to run an organization before maybe they've you know they're just really passionate about it um because with with these founders, we're not going to have that open forever. We're gonna we're creating a special founders board in order right. to really help guide. So it's it's you got to be passionate about it. You got to really be interested because you'll get a seat at at the actual table to really guide the whole design house in how we can be most beneficial. Yeah, and, and so achieve this. So they're looking for that, and but but. But uh, it's more important. You're looking for designers, and what the designers are. We're we're mostly focused on industrial design, interior design, architects, and fashion design. I've uh, I've done some talks and stuff in the fashion world. Yeah, There's a lot of interest in that space. Architects are interested right. in it. I'm an industrial designer, so I got to include that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, and we'll, we're starting there, but we'll we'll quickly expand into some consultants as well that are in this space, circular. Well, you're doing some workshops in Norway, which is exciting. Yes. You're doing some workshops here, so uh, and that's for any kind of company really to to learn how do you take all those components to create the greatest impact because you by doing those phases and having that observation or consciously taking the 90 percent of the planning and reviewing and strategizing before you execute that is really what this helps with yeah and we're doing to your point of workshops we're doing kind of general workshops if you're just interested and yeah. want to really learn and then we're we're taking a little bit of a different approach at, um, with our certifications and with that so you can be certified too oh, that's great only do working with design agencies and consulting agencies design because agencies. Okay. our kind of overarching idea is that if we get design agencies and consulting agencies certified they're going to be able to make way more impact than we can because we don't have to go hunt for clients we don't have to connect we can help them help their entire client list all at once and so that's our a kind of strategy to fast track and really scale this, which is something we haven't seen other organizations really doing. And right. we're, we're really focused on, this is a good idea, but we want circular economy to happen in our lifetime, not a hundred years from now. So how do we scale quickly and get this done? And help people become better stewards. Absolutely. So where we can find you is, we'll put it on the show notes, but it's ConsciousDesignHouse.com, which is yep. creating Bauhaus 2.0. Uh, then we have the ConsciousDesignBook.com. Yep. And then where else? I have my design firm where we work with clients to launch products and brands. That's PetermanFirm.com. And then and if you look up just Ian Peterman 
on Google. I should be in the most of the first five pages of Google <laughs> at this point. So it's it, you should be able to find me. I'm on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a good way. If you send me a connection request, do put a note. I skip everyone that doesn't. Oh, um, that's interesting. Unless I know them. Okay. If I've, if I've met you, I'll, I'll accept. But otherwise, <laughs> put a note. Otherwise, I have no idea what you're what you're doing, and I have too many connections already. So. Yes. Well, that's fantastic. So I want to thank you. Thank you so much for the work you've done. Uh, I, I believe that this is something that needs to become more famous, which the podcast is about become famous. I think this is something that needs to dominate the world where world waves, airwaves, radio waves on the whole environmental issue because we're focusing so much on solving a problem. Let's start from the beginning and solve the problem at the beginning so you don't have a problem at the end. Yes, I think mean, that's that. really what's key. So uh, thank you so much for your time um, and thank you for listening. And uh, yes. Thanks for having me. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you for listening to Become Famous Podcast. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review our show. Your support helps us keep bringing you valuable insights on achieving fame in your industry. Keep shining and see you next time.